Hey guys, it's Mitch. How's it going? It's been a while, but we're coming back around to another Valiant book. If you're going to talk 90s comics, you can only, you know, ignore the Valiant ones for so long before you're just kind of editing history. And this is a big book. This is Valiant's second superhero comic book, the first superhero with powers. That's something. Uh, this is going to be Solar Man of the Atom number one. So just before we get into it. If you enjoy the channel, if you feel like you might want to help out a little bit, what you can do is in the description there's a link to my Patreon. And if you subscribe there, that'll give you access to everything I do, from the Blood Force stuff to the YouTube videos before they get uploaded to YouTube, as well as some Patreon-exclusive content. Alright, so I went over a little bit of Valiant's history the last time when we covered uh, the first four issues of Magnus. So we'll just do a quick recap. Jim Shooter gets fired from his editor-in-chief position at Marvel. And after an attempt to buy Marvel, that apparently came very close... He settled on the next best thing, which was to create his own company that would compete with Marvel. The problem, of course, is that he had shareholders and co-owners who had at least as much say as him in the company's uh, direction. So, of course, Valiant starts out by putting out comics about what was popular at the time, which was video games and wrestling. The problem, of course, is they were so popular at the time that video games and wrestling saturated like every market, so nobody gave a shit about comics. So the next step for Jim Shooter was to buy some existing comic book properties. And after a couple of possibilities, they settled on the old Dell Gold Key characters, Magnus Robot Fighter, Turok, and Solar Man of the Atom, which had a bit of popularity in the late 60s, early 70s. So the first thing they do, they put out Magnus Robot Fighter number one, followed shortly by Solar Man of the Atom number one. And both books do all right. They have like modest print runs of 60,000, I think, which, you know, I mean... Sounds pretty good today, but that's like extremely modest for 1991. And after those two books, they start adding new books and kind of branch out from there. To the point where Valiant is competing with Marvel and DC. Uh, kind of in the position Image is these days, where they're, you know, Marvel and DC are still the big two, but, you know, Valiant is, has a sizable market share in 1991. 92-ish. So the mission statement for Valiant Comics was going to be well-written stories. That was basically the only priority, to the point where, for artists, they, they just had to get anybody they could. They couldn't afford anybody with any kind of name. They were taking other people's cast-offs, which worked for Jim Shooter because he was always a proponent of the house-style method of creating comic books. However, one artist he was able to talk over from Marvel, I don't know how hard it was, because this particular artist was, was quitting comics fairly often, but he was in one of those phases, Barry Windsor Smith had just finished up Weapon X and was, again, dissatisfied with working for mainstream comics. So Jim Shooter enticed him to come work for him at Valiant, where they cared all about the craft of comics. They wanted to tell real stories. You know, they would get good artists eventually. And in the meantime, Barry Windsor Smith would draw a couple of comics. He'd throw in a bunch of covers. And he could do stuff that resonated for him artistically. Barry Windsor Smith, of course, would eventually leave because Valiant become very much like Marvel and DC in, like, two years. But at the beginning, anyway, he was all in. So we might as well start with our Barry Windsor Smith cover here, which is uh, pretty great. It's iconic now, I think. Should be. Like, you're never going to complain about the artwork on a Barry Windsor Smith cover. But, you know, even apart from just the rendering, the composition's very nice, like, off-center and everything. And it's intriguing, right? What the fuck am I looking at, even? Dude hovering above the earth, either exuding goo, or perhaps attracting goo. That could be possible, too. All right, let's get into this here. Nice opening. Part one of four. Uh, the overarching story is called Second Death, and the title for this issue is No Place Like Home. And we're going to start things off with a splash. The Valiant books do go by that, which is nice. We're not going to get a double splash, though. I don't even have to, like, flip back to check. We, you just know. But yeah, we start off with a dude falling to Earth, essentially, going, why am I here? Where, where, what happened to my clothes? I'm usually careful about my clothes. And again, not kind of intriguing. So, dude falls to Earth. Nice shot. I mean, we're using photos for the Earth. Which, I mean, at the very least, it looks good. It's, it's a little bit of cheating, maybe. But Valiant has to do everything it can to kind of cut corners and, you know, make sure they stay on schedule. That's a big thing for Jim Shooter, of course. And this issue is going to be drawn by, of course, because it's a Valiant book, we have to check in the back. Jim Shooter doesn't like putting credits in there. Don Perlin. 
who is like an old house style guy. So guy continues to fall to Earth, doesn't seem perturbed that he's in space, wonders where Muskegee is. I, I don't know how to pronounce that. Muskegee? I don't know. And thinks maybe it's been in, uh, everything's been shifted a little bit to the left. Flies in more photo backgrounds. I assume this is probably a photo too, actually. And gets to what I assume is his apartment. And yeah, just kind of floats in. So assuming this is our protagonist, he, he isn't bound by physics, right? I mean, we all, we're all going to assume this is solar here. So finds the spare key and gets into his apartment. And nobody noticed the naked guy wandering around outside. So that's a victory. And all this stuff looks fine. And honestly, that's what we're going to get going forward. We're not going to get anything that looks particularly special, but we won't get anything that, that looks weird and, you know, fucked up. This is exactly what Jim Shooter wants, stuff that is competent. So he goes into his bedroom, is able to find the clothes he wants, but then notices that somebody is here who races into the bedroom and is going to bash him with a bust of Albert Einstein until he realizes that he looks familiar. And the clothes that this guy's putting on, he thinks he's in his apartment, are this guy's clothes. Now, I'm being kind of obtuse on purpose here. So these are the same guy. This is Phil Seleski, who is the hero of our story. Only this one has superpowers, and this one clearly doesn't. And while he just sits there in confusion, superpowered Phil just kind of teleports out the window there. And regular Phil has to wonder if he's hallucinating. He hasn't been getting a lot of sleep lately, and he probably just had a moment where he, you know, just kind of a quick little psychotic episode. It's over now. Good to go. Okay, so we're in kind of a tenuous position here now. We're five pages into the issue, and we don't really know anything about anything just yet. We know this is probably our guy, or maybe this. They seem to be maybe the same guy. We know this guy has some kind of powers, and that's really all we know. We don't know his name. We don't know what he does. We don't know why he. this one has powers. We don't know what the scenario is. So the whole thing right now, we're not invested. It's just how intrigued are you by a dude who can fly in space? So we might as well keep reading about the dude who can fly, who flies away. And he also thinks that what he just saw was a hallucination. And he's just kind of going to go on with his evening from here. So he says, what is there to do tonight? So he doesn't have an objective, which I'm not a fan of, really, in a book where so far there's nothing to root for, there's no stakes or anything. So he listens in for some, I, I believe these would be radio frequencies. There's something about um, people trying to raise a sub in Russia. There's another one here about six dead and many unaccounted for at a prison riot. So that's the one he's going to start out at. So, cut to our prison riot. Uh, pretty pretty well drawn prison riot. Surely don't have any problems with that. And, you know, that's going to be the case going forward. So, a bunch of prisoners have trapped a guard in the bathroom. And they're going to do some horrible shit to them. And um, Solar here what just kind of appears. And he's glowing and everything. Everybody stops short. And he kind of increases his glow. So that the, the violence in this room at least will stop because everybody's just going to be fucking blinded. And this is all, you know, fine stuff with him just kind of going from guy to guy and disarming them all. Although he doesn't notice this guy here sneak up on him. And he stabs him in the back, which releases a shit ton of energy. It looks like it burns his face right off, too. That's all right. And now he's, yeah, like leaking radioactive energy. And it just fills the room and it starts, like, melting the ground and, and setting shit on fire. And his biggest concern right now is that it's, his jacket is ruined because it's got that hole in it from the knife. So otherwise he can protect his clothes. Then we cut back to other Phil who is arriving at work somewhere. We don't really know where. So we finally learn uh, this other Phil's name. This is Doc Seleski. And the security guard makes a joke about him having just left unless he's got a twin brother, which doesn't sit too well with Phil. Another dude pops in, thought he went home. So I'm not sure what's going on here, because it's not like Super Phil here has stopped by where regular Phil is working. But whatever, maybe everybody's just like spatially unaware. So Dr. Dobson here advises Phil that they're installing the core of magnets about now, and since he's here, he ought to stop by the containment. So he goes to do that. So again, we still don't really have any idea what the shit is even going on. Uh, cut to the core, I guess. 
where Phil is approached by some woman, and all of a sudden Phil is much more agitated than he was in the last couple of panels, and he kind of snaps at her, and she leaves. Yeah, he was pretty calm here, and down here, he, not nearly as much. Anyway, this is Gail. She'll come back. And cutting back to uh, Super Phil. So I guess he's done with the prison riot. He's flying now over Russia, and he intercepts those uh, Navy ships that were going to try and raise the submarine from the ocean's depths. While flying over them, Phil uh, scans using infrared, and he's able to locate the sub, goes underwater, emits some light so that he can see what he's doing, so that's nice. Determines what the problem is, that it's leaking air, and that the uh, dive planes are messed up, and starts to try and come up with solutions. He figures he could weaken gravity. That would work, but it might roil up the water and swamp the surface vessels. So instead, he's going to do it manually where he just kind of lifts it. So we are learning at least a little bit about Super Phil where we learn, okay, he's not just flying. He doesn't just teleport or whatever. He does have like all sorts of powers. So raises up the sub right to the surface. The Russians are a little confused about what's even going on. This is, this is all fairly nice stuff, actually. It's not super exciting or anything, but it is cool looking. And then Phil gets on top of the sub, pops all the locks on the missile silos that it was housing, and levitates all of the nuclear missiles out of the submarine. The captain can't have that and takes a couple of shots, which find their mark. He's a good shot. Oh, we'll come back to this. And Phil levitates towards them. He's leaking a little bit, but its I, I think this is more for effect at this point. He does turn up the uh, illumination, which, of course, turns up the heat and approaches them. And they start igniting and they can dive into the water. They'll be okay. Other than some light burns. All right. So Phil takes off out of there with the nuclear weapons in tow, goes right into space, and tries to think about how best to dispose of them. And he decides he wants to detonate them. So he's just going to throw some neutrons at them, which he figures ought to work. And I'll take his word for it. And that's the explosion. Not terribly impressive, and I suppose it wouldn't be in the context of just, you know, shit happening in space. And then after the explosion, he puts himself back together, which is a cool shot. And again, another thing that we didn't know he could do. All right, so he gets back to Earth, and now he's still, he's looking again for something to do. So yeah, this is a dude with unlimited power who just is completely aimless. Like, it's nice that he's doing good things. But he has no real purpose. I, I suppose eventually he'll find one. But, you know, it would be nice if we maybe came into his story when he had a purpose. And then flash back to this stuff where he was just kind of doing, you know, good deeds, getting cats out of trees and shit. So he decides to go to Manhattan. Another photo background. Flies around in the city to see if there's any trouble that he can take care of. Uh, he's able to listen in on a newscast where it turns out Russia is denying responsibility for the explosion in space. The U.S., however, ta are taking this as a signal that Russia is stepping up their space weapons technology. And the U.S. is uh, going to a high heightened state of alert. You know, they're not exactly going to DEFCON anything, but, you know, it, it, it's just, it, it's not a good thing when nuclear explosions are happening anywhere. Okay, so Super Phil decides that's enough, and he's going to go descend into the city just in time to get spotted by the woman leaning out the window. Nobody thinks this is too amazing. They're just like, man, how's he doing that? Which I would think would be more of a response these days where nobody believes anything. All right, so cut back to normal Phil at his job. We don't know what that job is, but I mean, I do. I, I, I read this in advance, but I'm waiting for the point where we find out in the context of the comic. I, we're still not really there yet. But Phil runs into uh, another, uh, you know, co-worker. That's about, about as much as you can say in, at this point which is Dr. Pierce, who will be showing up again in the series. And Dr. Pierce is basically on a par with Phil. They do the same job or, you know, pretty close to. Uh, they're on the same level in terms of authority, in terms of responsibility. And they're both in a heightened state of anxiety because whatever project they're working on is seems to be getting closer to reaching fruition. And so it, we get through the exp exposition here. Uh, this is where they mention the fusion reactor is a wonderful opportunity for science. The concept is almost entirely yours, and therefore I have respect for you. Okay, so it's all right. So these are nuclear physicists, and they're working on a fusion reactor. And Phil is bringing up the fact that he thinks he's maybe seeing things, 
Uh, you know, maybe like has his mind playing tricks on him. And she's like, dude, this is not the place for people with unstable minds. Get your shit together or fuck off. And she calls him a psycho chicken and Phil leaves. We're going to keep getting people called psycho chickens. I don't know what's up with that. All right. Then we cut back to Super Phil, who is resting on the street in Manhattan. And we get, you know, a bit of a broad view of what's going on on the street. So uh, a couple of homeless people, just a, a bunch of vagrants. And, you know, it's 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 not exactly one of the nicer parts of town. But the vagrants are going to be nice to each other. Uh, this one guy here offers Phil a drink. Phil turns him down, which, you know, this guy decides to take offense at. Like, he thinks he's better than him. So Phil changes his mind. Uh, the, the alcohol is not going to affect him at all, but he doesn't want to be rude. So they get into a bit of a conversation. Introductions are made all around. And we kind of talk about Phil having some problems, but he doesn't really want to get into them. So over the course of the conversation, it kind of turns into a little bit of an encounter group where they're all kind of quizzing Phil on what his problem is. He brings up that he does have a home. I'm like, wait, what? So why are you here? Why don't you go there? And he's kind of afraid to go back because, you know, last time there was a creepy dude there. It looked an awful lot like him. Somebody brings up, you know, do you have a girlfriend? Maybe you should go see your girlfriend. And he goes, oh, yeah, my girlfriend. And he mentions Gail, who was the woman that normal Phil snapped at in the reactor core. And he asks people what the date are. Uh, he is able to find a newspaper in a trash can. So date is September 27th, 1990, which means something to Phil. So now he's determined what he has to do. He's not going to tell us what it is. But he's got to fly back to Muskegee, Oklahoma. And again, nobody particularly perturbed that a dude is just going to fly away. I mean, you know, the one here was yelling at the hydrant with the toque on it. The other guy here, you know, he might be a little wasted. Who knows? So, you know, you can kind of see it. Okay, so we cut to a diner where regular Phil is meeting with his therapist. And they're meeting at the diner because Phil doesn't want the word to get out that he goes to a therapist's office, which is, uh, okay. So the therapist asks him, uh, you know, why are we talking? What is, what is this about? And Phil says, I had a hallucination. Therapist says, stop drinking. Phil says, I don't drink. And the therapist says, well, then start. Fun little exchange. So he explains the hallucination that he saw a dude there who looks like him. And now he's worried because, you know, he works at a place that could theoretically have massive ramifications for, I mean, who even knows what the scale would be. And the therapist kind of waves him off. Like, you know what? You've just been working too hard. You had a little escape fantasy. And you know what? You just kind of need a vacation. That's all. We're good. So maybe not the best therapist I've ever heard of. After the meal, Phil goes home. Again, nothing really exciting happening. And um, Super Phil is there. And now they're actually going to have a conversation. Kind of. Regular Phil asks him what he's doing in his apartment. Super Phil goes, you're right. I don't belong here. Regular Phil is going to call the police. He says, oh, don't bother. I'll, I'll be gone before they get here. But before he goes, he just wants to warn him that he's not going to just stand by and watch him make the same mistakes. And he'll kill him if he has to. And then Super Phil disappears in a cloud of goo. Most of the coloring in this uh, particular issue is, like, okay, I'd say. Every once in a while you get reminded that you're reading a Valiant book. The way Valiant colored stuff was basically just whatever they could find. They didn't really have much in the way of like Doc Martin does, I don't think. So they would use pencil crown. They would use marker. They would use airbrushes occasionally. Maybe pastels. Who knows? So Phil interprets this as somebody trying to haze him and scare him off of his fusion work. Which I don't know how you get to that conclusion. But okay. Mostly because they vandalized his coat. It's got all sorts of holes in it now from where he got shot. So I think we can think of Phil as one of those guys who, you know, is super smart, but has a lot of difficulty with like day-to-day -day life, you know? And Super Phil returns to the vagrants. Uh, they say that they're hungry and they didn't get much food that day and it's going to be cold. Uh, he can't help them with the food, but he can help them with the warmth at least as he turns on his luminescence. And that's it for that one. So... We should go to the beginning of Solar Number Zero, which is right here. So Solar Number Zero is the origin of Solar Man of the Atom. Uh, they explain right here, the origin of Solar Man of the Atom. I just said that. It was conceived by Bob Layton and Jim Shooter. It was developed by writer Jim Shooter and pencil artist storyteller Barry Windsor-Smith. Inked by Bob Layton, colored by, yeah, da, 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 da. Colored by Janet Jackson. Wow. Each of the first ten issues of Solar Man of the Atom 
So they're, you know, there's a little bit of ambition there. Will contain a free pullout insert like the one following this page, presenting one chapter of the origin. So you could pull it out or not. That's up to you. But it's going to be, you know, like this is an eight page sequence over 10 issues, 80 pages. That's all right. Of course, that's also including one piece of a gigantic panel. And we'll get to that in a second. So this is the origin they dreamed up. This is Phil, of course, uh, in what I assume is his house. And after what we've seen from the art in the rest of the issue, this is kind of fantastic. Where everything just looks kind of perfect. This is like uh, almost photorealistic in some respects, like the background. Not Phil himself, but you know, it's it's a it's a great looking drawing, and he's caught off guard by some something being very bright. Goes outside of his house, same house at least, that's nice. And he's gonna drive off to work. So this is home of the Edgewater Advanced Fusion Energy Research Center. So yeah, Phil woke up, realized something was bad, and considering where he works, that is as bad as things can be. Great looking artwork, nice and dramatic here. And this shot with the uh, the thing exploding. You know, all of a sudden I want to talk about artwork again. Who'd have thought? So Phil arrives at work and everybody's going nuts. They say here, maybe they can find a way to contain this to North America. And that doesn't sound too great. Dr. Dobson, who we met earlier, says we've tried everything except going in there and banging on the accelerators with a wrench. Dr. Pierce is yelling at Phil. He's not even really paying attention. Uh, Gail apparently came from some kind of party or something because she's still wearing like a party dress. And Phil's coming to terms with the fact that everybody here is dead because of uh, his project. And his reaction is like, man, that's a drag. If it was just me, that'd be okay. But everybody, man. And at that point, the lights go out. As I assume the chain reaction or whatever increases in effect. And Phil wonders if he should maybe go into his project and bang on the accelerators with a wrench. Again, nice looking stuff. All very good. And here, the uh, big piece of the puzzle thing doesn't really mean anything to us. But what this is going to be eventually is essentially the entire town he grew up in. So there's going to be 10 of these panels. And, you know, you can assemble them all if you want. They're not right in the middle of the book, so that's nice. You don't necessarily have to take them out to be able to see the whole picture. But that's it for solar number one. Um, I don't know. It's kind of a mixed bag. Like, it's interesting, but not extremely so. After reading the story, which was very vague and was, you know, intentionally hiding a lot of information, and then going to number zero, where we got like five pages in total, and then going to the big piece of the puzzle, it kind of feels like a random bunch of stuff. And I mean, there's the two fills in the comic itself. Then there's the fill in Solar Number Zero, and you're like, is that the same one? Is that the regular fill? Is that Super Fill? Is that another one? Honestly, this first issue is, it's a bit of a mess, really, overall. I'd be interested to see where it goes, but I'm not exactly motivated to pursue it, because, like, so far, there's nothing really to follow up on, other than, why does this guy have superpowers? You know, even the stuff that Phil's working on, they don't go into at all. I'm not interested in it. I... You know, I'll give spoilers now, because why not? It's a 30-year-old comic. If you want, you can just skip to the end, or I don't know, whatever. Um, the whole deal with Phil is that, well, you know, what happened in Solar Number Zero there in the middle, his project started having a meltdown. Phil goes into the reactor to try and fix it manually, and it explodes, and it actually destroys the planet. But Phil being at the center of the explosion... Uh, somehow gives him, it's, it's like Dr. Manhattan shit where he's able to put himself back together and that gives him the ability to like manipulate reality essentially. And what he does is he decides to recreate the earth exactly as it was, or at least as how he remembered, I guess. So what we get at the beginning there with him going down to the surface, I assume that's after he's originally created everything. He doesn't mention anything about it. It would be nice if he did, I think. And now one of the things he wants to do uh, is he wants to stop his old self from setting off the project and destroying the world, you know. And I'm like, huh, that's a cool story. That's uh, I'd like to see how that gets developed. And then you read it and it's like, oh, no, I don't. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't feel like something that was efficiently plotted out. You can kind of see where he wants to go with it. I assume that he had a plan and just I, I don't like the plan. 
I think there's another confrontation between the two fills in the next issue. I might do it at some point. I do have it. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's not exactly a priority for me. But, anyway, that's it for Solar Man of the Atom, number one. Uh, eh, eh. Not as cool and story-oriented as I was hoping, I have to say. But, I mean, the company did pick up Steam, and it did get a lot of readers, and it did add more properties to it. I mean, Solar itself would be the platform that Valiant used to launch a whole bunch of shit. Uh, they, that was where they first introduced the Harbinger Company. That was where they first introduced Eternal Warrior and Exo Manowar and the Geomancers. And they spun all sorts of shit off of that. So that's cool. We will check out more Valiant in the future. Maybe we won't do more Solar. I'm not for sure. We had to check out the first one, though, to see what it was about. Anyway, that's going to do it for this one. Thanks very much for watching. If you like this video, please hit like, hit subscribe, hit the notifications so you know when the next one's coming out. Go over and subscribe on my Patreon. That'll give you access to everything I do, from the Blood Force stuff, the pages in the finished comics, to the YouTube videos before they get uploaded to YouTube, as well as some Patreon-exclusive content. You can also follow me on Instagram and DM me there for commissions. All right, who's got recommendations for the next Valiant book we should check out? I have a bunch, so we might do it. So leave recommendations in the comments below. Uh, but yeah, that's going to do it. Thanks again. I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye-bye.